Hello again, this is Nick. Today I am reading Herm Habitat Range Niche Territory by Martha Wells. I hope you enjoy. Is this really a good idea? There is no way to honestly answer that question without being insulting. So Ida Mensa opts for, if I had known the survey team might almost be murdered in a corporate sabotage attempt, I would have picked another planetary franchise. She's in one of the planetary council offices on Preservation Station, talking to Ephraim, a fellow councillor who was planetary leader last term, and should know better than to have this conversation. The office is a bland one, meant for temporary work. The chairs are comfortable, but it's undecorated. The walls are default cool silver blue. It's making her uncomfortable in a way it hasn't any other time she's been in here. Maybe someone's adjusted the local environmentals badly? The air feels still and oppressive, though it's not warm. It makes her skin creep. It's the exact same size as the room she was held prisoner in on Tranwell and Haifa. It would be unbearable, if not for the message packet pinging in her feed. Ephraim sighs. That's not what I meant. She knows it wasn't what he meant. And her answer is a lie, anyway. Knowing what would happen, she wouldn't choose a different planet, a different bond company, because then SecUnit would still be someone's property, would be waiting for the contract where the negligence or greed or indifference of its clients got it killed. If not for SecUnit, Ida Mensa would be dead, her body dumped in a recycler somewhere on Tranwell and Haifa, or some other supposedly neutral transit station. Or well, the value of neutral that meant whatever the highest bidder wants. It's difficult for Ephraim and the other counsellors and her family, and almost everyone else she's spoken to since returning home to understand that. But none of them have any real experience with Corporation Rim except as a source of cartoonish villains in media serials. Ephraim adds, No one is questioning your response to the original situation. Ida's lost the thread of the conversation, and unlike SecUnit, she can't run back a recording to see what she missed. She needs to suggest that they leave this room and go up to the council office with the windows looking over the admin foyer, they need privacy for this talk, and though Ephraim is a friend, it would be a sign of weakness she can't afford. Oh, yes. She was unfairly intimating that he had said her choice of survey world was at fault. It's not, and that's not what he meant. But she wants to make him say what he does mean. She steeples her fingers. That was the inciting incident. Ephraim is frustrated, and he only wants what's best for her and for preservation, which is what makes this so awkward for both of them. It's hard to make a proper argument when you're both on the same side. You've brought a corporate, he hesitates. She wonders if he was going to say, killing machine. He finishes, a product of corporate surveillance capitalism and authoritarian enforcement to the seat of our government. I agree your reasons were good, but this is a situation that has to be addressed. There we go. That's something she can work with. The killing machine in question has just sent her yet another message packet. They are piling up in her feed. And if she would stop encouraging SecUnit by opening them, it would probably stop. 
they are all formal requisition forms for preservation station security. Request for increasingly improbable armaments. She responds to the latest with, I don't even know what that is. It's a good thing she understands Sekunit's sense of humour. To Ephraim, Ida says, The situation is a person who saved my life multiple times and the lives of the rest of my team. Sekunit is also a person who is not supposed to have access to the requisition forms, or to station security systems at all. She knows Sekunit is not so much taunting her with its abilities as refusing to pretend to be anything other than it is. And that's for the best, because being honest about that is the only way forward. If she's honest with herself, which she hasn't been, not since arriving back home, she would admit that being in this room has put her in a cold sweat. It helps that Ephraim's here, but she would have to get up and walk out if not for those message packets. Ephraim is a good person, and he won't make the argument that Sekunit is not a person, not qualified as a refugee under preservation law, because they are all refugees in Preservation Alliance, descended from people who were left to die because rescue was deemed not cost-effective, because they stand on this station built from the ship that saved their grandparents' lives and helped them for no other reason than because it was there and it could. Instead, Ephraim asks her, can you separate that person from the purpose they were created for? Now that's an argument. Sec unit is a person, a potentially very dangerous person. But right now Ephraim and the other counsellors who agree with him have no evidence to suggest that Sec unit would act on that potential. The problem is that part of her mind still believes she's on Tranwell and Haifa, held prisoner by corporate murderers. Being aware of that should help, but it doesn't. The message packets echo that moment when Secunit pinged her feed, and she knew rescue was possible. The moment she became herself again and not a bargaining chip. That helps. Ida spreads her hands, palms up and open. I couldn't. The person separated itself. Ephraim's mouth turns down, as if he wishes she had a more definitive answer. She knows he doesn't like this conversation any more than she does. They both would like to pretend everything is all right. Ida wishes she could separate herself from everything that happened. She can't. They talk for another 20 minutes, back and forth, and reach no conclusion but a wry agreement that the rest of the council will also want to have this conversation. Probably several times. As Ephraim gets up, and Ida can finally walk out of this damn room, she replies to Secunit's latest requisition form. It's for a gunship nearly the size of Port Free Commerce's transit ring. I think you made this one up. The Corporation Rim has always been a slave state. Though it calls its institutionalized slavery contract labor. The production of human bot constructs is just a more horrific twist. A mental slavery as well as a physical one. At least the victims of contract labor are free to think their own thoughts, but we tell ourselves that constructs aren't aware of their predicament. Sec unit makes us realize is that this is not true. 
they are all aware of what they are and what's been done to them. But the only choice they are ever offered is obedience or pain and death. Ida transfers her attention from the feed document to Bharadwaj, seated in front of her. They are in her office lounge, on the comfortable chairs near the balcony that overlooks the station admin's central atrium. The large space is lit by floating overheads that imitate the natural glow of the system primary, and the office lights are tuned down to take advantage of it. It's quiet out there, except for footsteps or fragments of conversations as people pass by. No music. No babble of advertisements forcing their way into your feed. Ida tells Bharadwaj, It's good work. I think you have a chance to persuade them. Bharadwaj smiles a little, looking out toward the atrium. Ida has a flash of her sprawled on rocky ground, bloody and torn. Valescu is screaming somewhere off camera and winces it away. Bardwaj agrees. I think I can persuade them to enact more protections in our own territory. But it feels like so little. She's right, of course. Until bots have full autonomy, this problem is not going away. And the other problem is that sec units aren't bots and aren't human. They fall between the cracks of existing protections, even in the Preservation Alliance. But Bardwaj's idea for a documentary series has real potential. It can influence people in every corner of the Alliance, and, if they're lucky, infiltrate the Corporation Rim in a way nothing else can. But in the best case scenario, it will take years. And even then, it's going to be difficult. The propaganda has been so effective. Bardwaj's smile turns awry. It worked on us. It did. Ida had known what constructs were, but the full reality of it hadn't hit until she had listened to sec unit Cox Valescu out of the pit as the jerky video had played in their team feed. Along with the horror of what had just happened, there had been the dawning realization that they had fallen into thinking of their sec unit as a faceless machine, a convenience, an interface with their security system. But it had taken a sentient being who understood fear and pain to talk its way through Valescu's blind terror. Bharadwaj's expression turned serious. We cannot ignore the fact that sec units are capable of being very dangerous. Glossing over that is just going to make our argument look ridiculous. Her mouth twists. They are every bit as dangerous as humans. Except humans can't fire energy weapons out of their arms, calculate the exact right moment to jump off a rushing vehicle and survive, or hack the systems of an entire transit station port, Ida thinks. Then answers her own point. No, humans have to hire someone to do all that for them, or enslave a bot human construct. She makes a note of that in the open work document in her feed. It's a theme Bharadwaj might be able to build a persuasive argument around. Her feed notifies her of a message packet, addressed to her and Bharadwaj. It's a link to some sort of catalog weapon supply service? I decides, mostly amused. <laughs> It's listening to us right now. It must be hard to respect other people's privacy when you've had to fight and scheme for every minute of your own. 
hard not to be paranoid when you remember all the times your paranoia was justified. It's about being treated as a thing, isn't it? Whether that thing is a hostage of conditional value or a very expensively designed and equipped enslaved machine slash organic intelligence. You're a thing. And there is no safety. And she tells herself, you're being very foolish. Because you were hostage for a period of days, and it was a minor inconvenience compared to what Murderbot... No. Sec unit. She's never been given permission to use that private name. What sec unit went through. And if someone else was in her position, she would tell them how unhelpful comparisons like that are. That fear is fear. Barra Dodge squints as she reads the message and laughs. I don't even know what that is. Ida looks at the catalogue image. It's the thing that fits on a backpack or harness and has giant extendable spikes. She sends back, Alright, I believe that it's real, but it doesn't look very practical. Ida is in the station hotel suite that they took for sec unit and the members of the survey team while they were all reporting to the council. Pinli, Rati, and Garathan are still staying here with Arada and Overse, who are back now after a quick trip down to the planet to see their family. Baradwaj, who has her own quarters on the station, has dropped in, and Valeski, who is on the planet now, has been sending them his own work via the station com. Now that the fur over corporate murder and abduction is dying down, the survey needs to finish its reports so the council can decide if they want to pursue their claim on the planet. Ida could work with them on the feed from her office, but she likes being here. Sitting on the couches, in the common room, and talking face to face. The floating display surfaces filled with their data and collated notes. The sec unit is tucked into a chair in the corner probably watching media in its feed. It's good to have it here too. It's a relief to finally be getting this done. Pinley flicks between different displays. She's working on a contract they would offer to the corporate buddy who owns the planet in question. In the corporation rim, everything has to be owned by someone. Oversay. Sitting with Arada's bare feet on her lap, gestures in frustration. It would be closer being done if Roddy's tables weren't all over the place, and all the links broken. What were you thinking, Roddy? I was planning to sort it all out the day that Grigris started trying to kill us. It was very distracting, Roddy protests. I'll do it, Ida finds herself saying. Can you send me that file? She shouldn't do it. At least, not now. So late in the station's day? She should go back to her family in her quarters soon. But it's easier here. Where everyone knows what happened, and no one feels the need to ask questions, or is trying to get her to tell them Everything is fine, and she is exactly the same as the day she left. Work is a good excuse. Pinley has already pulled up another file and is frowning slightly. I need to review our billing, too. Oh, this is ridiculous. We're not paying for their extra power overrun. There's no way they can prove that was us. Sec unit must be watching Pinley's feed where the billing documents are, because it says suddenly, you didn't get the retrieved client protocol? They had offered it to Ida on the gunship after the attack, standard for clients who survive traumatic incidents, like being abducted and held hostage by corporate rivals. No. No, I didn't. 
She didn't want a corporation's excuse for a trauma support specialist poking around in her emotions. She almost adds, I didn't need it, which would be a dead giveaway. And then it occurs to her, a giveaway of what? What is she worried about giving away here among these people she trusts with her life? Sec unit is looking at the file corner, as it usually does. But they installed cameras for it in these rooms, so it was probably watching her expression. It says, Why not? Is it free here? It's not free in the corporation, Rem. Arada, brow furrowed in concentration as she studies the display surface above her head, is still editing her own report. Pin Lee flops back in her chair in exasperation. The stupid bond company lets you get abducted and then wants you to pay for the medical assistance afterward? Still not meeting anyone's gaze, Sec Unit's expression flashes through a brief, eloquent, ironic twist. Ida hides a smile. Of course you have to pay for it. She adds, We don't have. A retrieved client protocol here. Eversa glances over at her, bemused. Well, we do. It's just not called that. Baradwaj looks up from her feed. Yes, the trauma unit at Makaba Central Medical has a whole section for emotional support. Velescu said that he's been attending regularly. The one at Station Medical isn't as extensive, but I find it helpful. That was taking the conversation to a place Ida didn't want to go. I might have time later, she tells them easily, and pours herself another cup of tea. When she glances up, Sekun is actually looking directly at her. Their gaze is locked for what seems like a long moment, but knowing Sekun is only a second at most. As its gaze shifts back to the corner, Ida feels her cheeks flush, as if she's been caught in a lie. Well, it was a lie. Garathan, still wrapped up in his feed and reports, expression distant and internal, gets up to fumble for the carafe on the sideboard. Is there any more syrup? I'll get it. Ida takes the chance for a brief escape. I need to stretch my legs. She walks out of the suite, down the corridor to the small lobby area. It's empty and quiet, though the doors to the larger public hotel section are open, where there are potted trees and a wood and canvas art installation meant to invoke a traditional preservation camp house. It's getting on towards station night and hotel visitors on local time will be out looking for entertainment and food. On the far wall, there's a pantry. The cases stocked with cold drinks, soup and tea bottles, packaged self-heating meals, seasoning packets, and net bags of fruit and vegetables from the planet, cubed or peeled and ready to eat. Ida has been in the corporation rim long enough to appreciate the fact that it's free not only to the hotel's guests, but to anyone who walks in. And what a marvel that is. Just like the station restrooms with the showers where the only requirement is that you put your towel in the cleaning unit before you leave. She opens the door of a cold case to look for syrup and nut milk. When she closes the door... There's a stranger standing there, a stranger not wearing a station uniform or an access badge, his clothes not the colours or common cut to the planet. Even before her brain processes all that, she gasps. He says, you are Dr. Mensa, aren't you? It's not a question, he knows exactly who she is. She takes a step back and bumps into someone's chest, 
Before she can panic, the words are in her feed. It's me. It's Murderbot, sec unit, who was monitoring her feed or watching on a surreptitiously installed camera or had simply heard her gasp from down the corridor and through a room full of conversation. The stranger has had time to process the fact that there is now another person in the room. He raises his hands hurriedly. I, I'm a journalist. I, I didn't mean to startle. Station security is 47 seconds out. Second, its voice is even and conversational and confident. This is a confrontation it knows how to handle. It slipped in front of her, reassuring lean bulk between her and the intruder. It's also somehow managed to catch the syrup bottle she had dropped without noticing, and sets it on the counter. 46. 45. 44. The journalist flails and runs. The others arrive in a noisy mob. Questions, worry, Rati exclaiming, Sekuna jumped over my head. It was nothing, Ida assures them. Just a journalist. He startled me. I was distracted and didn't hear him. It's nothing. She hands Rati the syrup and shoes them back toward the room. I'll talk to security. It's fine. Really. They go. Reluctantly. The fact she's a current planetary leader weighs less than that she's also their survey captain, and they are used to following her orders. As they move noisily back down the corridor, station security is already in her feed, reporting that they caught the journalist leaving the hotel and will verify his identity and to release him if it checks out. We'll meet her here in a few minutes to make a formal report. She needs to compose herself before they arrive. Secunit is still looming over her, radiating warmth. It must be able to do that at will. Normally its presence is cool. She's trembling, which is idiotic. Nothing happened. The journalist meant no harm. Could have been a hotel guest, or a hungry visitor, or the person who stocks the pantry, or... Sekunit is looking down at her. You can hug me if you need to. No, no, that's alright. I know you don't care for it. She wipes her face. There are tears in her eyes, because she's an idiot. It's not terrible. She can hear the irony under its even tone. Nevertheless, she can't do this. She can't lean on a being that doesn't want to be leaned on. Of all the things Sekunit needs, the only ones she can give it are room and time in a relatively safe space to make decisions for itself. Becoming a prop for her failing emotional stability won't do either one of them any good. Or, maybe there's something else she can give it. She looks up, keeping her eyes on its left shoulder, leaving it the option of meeting her gaze or not. In all those requisition forms you've been sending me, is there something you actually want? There's a considering pause. Drones. Small intel ones. Drones, of course. Like the ones they had on the survey, which had been extremely helpful. They would be eyes for Sekunit, in the many places where preservation has no cameras. I'll see what I can do. It's looking down at her still, and she can meet its gaze to make it look away, but that won't make it retreat. Is that a bribe? She can't help a smile. It does sound like a bribe. Just just a little. Depends. Will it work? I don't know. I never had a bribe before. 
She thinks she's deflected it, but then it comes right back around to its target. Maybe you should go to the station medical, like Dr. Baradouage. I can't. I'd have to tell them what was wrong, is her first thought. And yes, she's aware that's the problem. She can't bring herself to lie, so she only says, I'll try. There's a quiet, sceptical snort above her head, and she knows SecUnit isn't fooled. Station security is in the outer lobby, and SecUnit slips away down the corridor before they reach the doors. This concludes the reading of Home. Now, for anyone who gives a shit, I have a gripe to fucking pick with Mensa. Planetary Space Mum, I fucking love you. But, like, <laughs> Mel wanted to help you. <laughs> Mom, can I please hug you? I, I, I can hug you. <laughs> Mensa, no, no, I can't let you do that. <laughs> oh, my God. By denying yourself the comfort and the opportunity to have it support you. You've denied it the chance to even try, to even figure out if it does want to support you and give you affection in that way. You just... Mm. You're doing it again. <laughs> By being worried about the thing that you don't want to do, you end up doing it. I, this is fucking frustrating as shit. Anyway, um, the next recording that I'll be doing is for Obsolescence, which is a prequel to the Murderbot Diaries. It's set back when we were still in the solar system and recently branching out, relatively recently, it's been like a few centuries, of branching out into the system. Um, it's over fucking 9,000 words. <laughs> And has over, like, ten character voices. I don't think I kept the voices consistent here, because, like, I had, like, a day or a few days between readings, because of my chronic illness and stuff. So, sorry if the voices are inconsistent. And I'm sorry if for obsolescence they're even fucking worse. Um, anyway. Bye-bye. See you in the next reading.